The Dodgers might be allergic to elevating four-seam fastballs. Among all right-handed four-seamers thrown this season, the Dodgers sit third to last in the average height of those fastballs in the zone. The MLB average four-seamer is 2.5 inches higher than the Dodgers throw it. And the top three teams in terms of four-seam height are the Orioles, Astros, and Rays, all teams that are inside the top five, if not top 10, in terms of pitching pedigree. The four-seam fastballs of those three teams are 2.5 inches higher than the MLB average, which means their average location is five inches higher compared to the Dodgers. It's not that the Dodgers' particular kind of four-seam fastball shouldn't be thrown high, either. They're 11th in MLB in terms of average vertical break, and all of the teams in front of the Dodgers throw their righty fastball higher in the zone. The Dodgers are a sharp organization from a pitching standpoint, and yet they're doing something that's odd, especially compared to other organizations that we consider sharp in the pitching development sphere. Yoshinobu Yamamoto's fastballs to either-handedness have been mostly away. Tyler Glass now came over to the Dodgers from the Rays and subtly started throwing his fastball more away from righties than up. Ryan Pepio went to the Rays from the Dodgers and started eliminating any pitch that was more middle of the zone. In this small sample of Bobby Miller's fastballs we have, his location to righties has been away, not up, and this is a change from the prior year. Gavin Stone even throws his four-seam away to righties most of the time. The five pitchers I just mentioned too all miss bats at the top of the zone with their four-seam fastballs. This goes for Yamamoto, this goes for Glass now, it goes for Pepio too when he was with the Dodgers. It also goes for Bobby Miller and Gavin Stone. I get the overall number of five inches between the highest and lowest four seam locations in the league seems small, but I often think in these high level looks at things, it helps us learn something. So why? Why take this approach as the Dodgers, especially when the evidence supporting elevated fastballs is so strong? Four seamers, especially those that have good or even average carry, perform better at the top of the strike zone, especially on a swing miss level and to some extent in terms of expected slug or your favorite expected damage metric. I have a few ideas to justify this strategy for the Dodgers. Number one is that the Dodgers as a whole and their starting pitchers don't throw a lot of sweepers. And I think they might be using the away fastball to disguise to some extent their harder sliders. The Dodgers have the fourth lowest percent of what I would classify as sweeper sliders in innings one through five, 1.1%, where the average is nearly four times that amount. Tunneling is a concept we hear about a lot, but I often think what we're really talking about is just location. A fastball up and a tighter slider down separate pretty quickly in ball flight. If you were to hold everything else constant and just move the fastball location to more middle away, the gap between those two pitches in ball flight would be closer. You can look at tunneling on an arsenal construction level, which I think has some merit for sure, but most of the time the tunneling we reference or see on Pitching Ninja is just a guy hitting spots on consecutive pitches. So does moving the average fastball location closer to the slider help the breaking ball play up? Maybe. I know this point is anecdotal. I'd be curious to see some research on it, but I've heard it from enough coaches and players that I respect to consider it as plausible. I think one of the problems here on the public side is that we don't have full ball flight information. We have observed and inferred access. We know what happens at release and what we expect to happen by the time it gets to the plate. And we, then we know what actually happens. But when that pitch is breaking in ball flight, we're kind of blind to. And I wonder if in fact teams have a better understanding of this, perhaps the Dodgers, and apply it to this concept. The number two reason to justify this idea from the Dodgers has to do with predictability. I got a chance to talk to Padres starter Michael King about this very topic. He actually moved his primary forcing fastball location to the outer third of the plate versus right-handed hitters this season, which you could see in this plot compared to pounding it up in 2023. So why move it to that away part of the plate? I want to show multiple looks and different locations, so I used to always just down and force them down. I think forcing down away adds a wrinkle in the arsenal that I can throw early in the count. So where normally it's always just like rain the count, I was going to throw it as hard as I can. Top of the zone. Uh, as a reliever, you can live in one zone with one pitch. I start because they're only going to see it once or twice. And that. I start, I got to play times to both sides of the plate. And now I can get to two strikes easily by throwing two pitches that I'm very comfortable with locating away to the right. So it probably looks like on the, because I still go to a four seam up for the way with two yeah, strikes. Yeah. Uh, but I'm throwing a lot of them more down the way to establish 
experience for three other patients in my arsenal that I know I can throw for just a second. It's more me taking advantage of yes. patient hitters against the starter trying to wear me out. So it's going to be a going on the iron, trying to get as many swings as a soft knock as I can with the I would imagine to some extent the Dodgers would agree with Michael Kane. I've always wondered whether breaking an individual pitch into multiple locations against a hitter effectively creates a second pitch. The most obvious example I could think of right now is Javier Assad, who throws his cutter both inside and outside to left-handed hitters. If you're prepping as a hitter against Assad, I think there's merit to the idea that you wouldn't just say Assad throws a cutter, you'd say he throws a cutter inside and outside. The same goes for middle away fastballs. Even if they're count-driven location changes, like elevating fastballs late in the count, I would bet that it's not exclusively count-driven, meaning you can shock a hitter, so to speak, by flipping the location to up early in the count when they get too comfortable with that away fastball. I imagine this has some implications on post-game strategy as well. I think the planning from a hitter standpoint might go from what pitch does he throw in what count to what pitch does he throw in what location in what count, basically separating a pitch into multiple parts and allowing you to kind of play a bit more game theory behind pitching strategy versus an opposing lineup. And given the fact that the Dodgers are constantly in the playoffs, I could see this regular season usage perhaps being a way for them to set up hitters from when they eventually see them, especially in the National League, in the postseason. The number three reason to justify this approach for the Dodgers is that it might help them hold count leverage better, especially early in the count. This is the idea that most fastballs miss up into the pitcher's arm side. So I would theorize that by placing a target more away against a right-handed hitter, it would increase the probability of a strike because your miss has a better chance of clipping the zone. Even if by doing this, there's a greater chance for some damage in you missing over the heart of the plate. This is in contrast to the idea that if you put a target up in the zone, your natural miss is going to take you outside of the zone and potentially to the arm side, where there is basically a 0% chance of that pitch being a strike, even if you are avoiding damage. And in that situation, you fall behind, and when you're behind, no matter who you are, you're probably worse than a league average pitcher. The qualification that I'll throw in here, and Michael King mentioned this as well, is that it's not like the Dodgers never elevate four-seam fastballs. They increase their average right-hand four-seam height, or move them up in the zone when they get to two strikes in the count, or they have runners on base, and they do this by about four inches or so, which is marginally above the league average. And the same thing happens with runners on base. The league increases its righty four-seam height by barely an inch, and the Dodgers have the fifth highest increase in height when runners reach base at around two or three inches. This is a pretty optimal strategy from a game planning standpoint, I think. I've heard it called the Verlander approach before related to the idea of being really aggressive in the zone when your risk of loss is lower and that risk of loss being solo home runs, which are probably not gonna beat you as a pitcher. So that's my assessment as to why the Dodgers don't really elevate fastballs a ton. There's a really good analyst out there named Nick Pollock who works for Pitcher List, runs Pitcher List, and he has this idea of what he calls high lock or high location. How often are you throwing a fastball up in the zone? And I think to some extent listening to his analysis and talking to him a bit that he really likes that elevated forcing fastball. And I think it makes sense, especially when you look at it from the data angle. But I've heard that so much from him that this video is inspired by trying to think counter to his point. Why would an organization or a team or a player value the OA fastball? And these are the couple reasons I came up with. And it's funny because I do think there's some justification for it. I see both sides of the argument. I think I come down somewhere in the middle to some extent. The Dodgers like vertical movement, and we have seen some situations for where guys with outlier vertical movement, perhaps, or flatter approaches really hammer the top of the zone. I'm talking about Emmett Sheehan and Landon Knack here. So maybe there is some variation on the shape of the fastball in particular and where they're comfortable putting it in the zone. But it seems like even guys like Tyler Glasnow and Yamamoto, etc., who I would argue have average or above average vertical movement or unique enough shapes for them to work at the top of the zone, that they still don't do it. So perhaps there's another wrinkle or a subplot of this story, so to speak, that would shine light on why certain pitchers in the Dodgers org don't elevate a ton and why others do. That's maybe a video for another day. But anyways, I thought this was a cool idea. It's something I came across in looking at macro data, which I do a ton on the league level. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any thoughts or you think I missed any particular points, let me know. But I do think I hit on the main keys here, but always open to feedback and consideration from other people and other smart baseball minds out there that might have some thoughts. As always, thank you for watching.